What up, y'all? Tonight, we decided to take it on the road. Welcome to another episode of West Coast Wednesdays here on Hype-Radio.com. Tonight, like I always tell you, I'm going to bring you the best of the best. Well, it really don't get much more best than this. I'm bringing Mr. FAB, a.k.a. Mr. Dope Air, a.k.a. should be the damn mayor of Oakland by right now. That's my vote. That's what that's what I'm pushing for, for the mayor to be sitting here. But uh, tonight, we got a special-ass show. We're going to sit down here. We're going to get it going with this man. But, uh, bro. To be here on your time in the studio, appreciate you taking your time. Uh, sorry, yeah. I know it's all precious to you and everything, but let's go ahead and get to know the the, the, the man, the myth, and the legend. So, starting out in this music game, how long have you actually been in this game? I've been rapping, man, for a minute, man. I feel like I, I found my discovery of music through poetry. Okay. Um, that, that, discovery, that discovery of music. Music came from my love of poetry. Okay. My father died when I was about twelve years old, and at that time, I was uh, I was distraught emotionally. And when you're young, you're young and you're trying to figure out. You can't explain emotion because you haven't identified with what emotion that you're going through. And really, as young men coming up in our era, we weren't even taught. We, we were taught to not show emotion. Yeah, yeah, the, the, to, to embrace emotion, man. Right, you know, right. we, we haven't been authentically embracive in what it is that we were challenged with. And so a lot of the things that we grew up with, people weren't emotionally available to us. So right. trying to find an outlet to vent what it was that I was going through of losing a father, especially at that time I had lost a father to AIDS, and mm -hmm. we were also ignorant of what AIDS was at right. that time, and there were many different speculations of what it was and how it was contracted and right. things of that nature. And so being a young guy who, you know, every day you stood on the precipice of being teased or being, you know, about your father passing and things of that nature. So I developed a writing for, you know, my love for music. It became poetry, then it eventually later evolved. It was the caterpillar going into the, you know, to the butterfly or the tadpole into the, the bullfrog. And so um, just growing, man. So if we count those early days, it's, it's been a long time. It's been a, you know, it's been a thirty year, thirty year run. You know, what I'm saying, of just pen and pad movement and going, um, but a, like a serious rap career, it's almost about a dub. Yeah, it's, yeah, for it's sure. Just, now, as time went forward, you know, praises and, and blessings and you know condolences to the father being gone, uh, but. To move on, <laughs> told you we out here. We really in the studio with this man to, to to move forward to land your because you turn down hella deals for sure. Like what was your what was your process behind that? Because somebody come up in the music game, young like you did, to being where it was acknowledged by the majors. You know, a lot of cats would have jumped on some of them deals without thinking about it, but you decided. No, I don't want to go that route. What was some of your process in being able to say, no, I got this? Trust issues. You know, we come from a generation of people who we watch folks before us uh, get done over in the industry. You know, the industry had never been too friendly to individuals, especially coming from the areas and, you know, the terrains that we come from mm -hmm. where people aren't uh, business savvy and not knowing. And you know your lack of knowledge sometimes tends to uh, elevate your insecurities. Okay. And so your insecurities may be trust issues. Right. It may be uh, over analyzing things. Okay. You know we try to think for others, and we try to think like, oh no, you ain't finna do me. I ain't going out like, whoa, whoa, no, I ain't signing no, I ain't signing no artist deal. I'm on my own label, and not even knowing the first step of what it is to have your own label. Mm -hmm. You know, an office, an infrastructure, a team, a conglomerate of individuals that have your best interests mm -hmm. and, you know, and moving forward. Uh, and, and, and when you're going in that trajectory of things, it, it always gets difficult because there are certain situations that you may have played yourself out of. Right. You know, um, so the best advice um, would be to learn the music business just as well as you learn how to record and make music. Uh, so a lot of those things we walked away from, I, you know, I, I ended up later signing a, a, a label deal in 2006, 2007 with Atlantic Records, and it didn't pan out just based off the fact that I knew nothing about running a label. Mm, okay. I just knew that 
you know, I wasn't typically finna sign to anyone just based off, off ego purposes, just so I can say that I was a label. Um, and I, you know, sometimes you learn that why settle for 100% of a grape when you can have 20% of a watermelon? Okay. And um, <laughs> Damn. You know, those are things in life that you learn and you grow. And, and, and you understand that in business. Um, you'll never get what you feel you're worth, but you always will get what you're able to negotiate. So it comes to closed mouth, don't get fed kind of situation. You got to be able to negotiate this, but you have to know what it is that you're dealing with so you can have better chances and better odds at negotiating. So, okay. you know, that's why, you know, learning and knowledge is, uh, it's imperative that we begin to learn. Because most of the things that, unfortunately, the black eye and the blemishing of learning came from, oh, you were square. Mm. We associated knowledge and individuals that are articulate or intelligent as squares. And that's crazy. Like, oh, you be going to school and you're square. Like, I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd. Yeah. Because I'm informed. Right. So you mean to tell me that it's okay to be ignorant. Mm. And you're proud about your ignorance. And unfortunately, we brag about ignorance. And we raise ignorance at a level of it's accepted. So it's accepted to be ignorant. So as we act out, our ignorance is displayed in our comfort zones of life. Mm. So I tell people all the time, man, go get educated. Break the stigma of what someone can call you from being educated. Now, let's let's step away from music for a while, because sitting here talking, if, if if you didn't have some kind of intelligence, a lot of what you said or say would go over some people's heads. I sit up and I watch your your, your motivational speakings on the gram all the time. You've gotten through me gotten me through some some weird times. So I thank you for that. But did you feel that your knowledge came across because of what you've been through in life? Uh, who was somebody who helped you be able to, I don't want to say articulate, but articulate what you've gone through in life? Because some of the things you talk about on these rams is like, if you're not really listening to you, if people are just trolling through the gram like most do, they miss out on a lot of good information that you give based on things that you've done, been through, or you, you already kind of see what other people have done with that. When you say that people say it's because of squares and being a nerd and everything, you were no dummy back in the day. Never have been, but do you feel that that, that, that knowledge you had came through as you got a little bit older in the game, or was it just something that was in you already, or how, how, how do you come about being able to just about some of the things like some of the issues or things that's going on in the town or you know outside in the world like you really it's like some it's like God touches you before you wake up he like he's shaking you to wake you up and speak on this for me today um lived experience is a, uh, a hell of a journey to be able to have lived experience to embrace that to acknowledge that uh there are things in life that you go through that you can extract from. I've learned a lot of lessons in life of the things of sometimes some of my losses. Uh, other situations have, have taught me um, where in once of life it may have stagnated me, now it perpetuates me to move forward. Uh, a key component in the, develop of, the de development of you know my articulation was my mother. Mm. You know, when I would get in trouble as a kid, my mother would make me read the dictionary. And she would make me, you know, so it's always been in me. Um, but as I say, there was a child who acted as if he didn't know the answers in class because he didn't want the rest of the class to call him a nerd. Mm. And you become ashamed of your intelligence. You become ashamed of your ability that you're intelligent. And so you act dumb. You act... Uh, you don't want people to, I was in like, I was in Mesa, I was in Gate, I was in all of these programs, these extracurricular the programs, programs. programs, the advanced programs, and I dropped out of them, because mm. it wasn't cool to my friends. We get in the locker room, and he's like, oh, nigga, you a nerd, nigga, you in there with all them Indians, you in there with all them Asians, nigga, you, you a nerd. And so you start feeling bad about something that you've been blessed with. You've been blessed with a keen ability to learn and comprehension 
and knowledge and wisdom. And it's unfortunate that if you don't have the people around you that are pouring into you and telling you how those are good things, those are good qualities to have. Great qualities. As a child, if you don't have that, that pouring into, mm -hmm. you don't have that father that's telling you, hey man, them same niggas that's saying that gonna be in jail. Or worse. Or dead. Stay in these programs. And it's funny how life goes full circle. My daughter is in all those programs now. She's in Pidea program. Uh, she's I'll, be in seeing, I'll be seeing you and your daughter on the ground. She's you, in, got a, you got a queen that's going to be sitting on top of her mountain. Like she's in all of those programs, man. So it's just a beautiful thing. So like my message to the youth is embrace your children's. Uh, uh, to the parents, to my constituents, my parents, my, my colleagues. I'm telling them to pour into their children's brilliance. Never make them feel ashamed for being smart. Never make them feel ashamed like, oh, you sound white. Let them understand that if you're associating being able to articulate with white, you've already lost. Because if that's educated and now you're associating education with Caucasians, you've already lost. We created the first systems of schooling. We created the first educational systems. We come from, we are, you know what I'm saying, the diaspora of the first universities. So if anything, I sound very so much black. You know what I mean? Real so, 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 you know what I'm saying? So, um, I'm just doing it with an English accent. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, man, embrace your children, man. Embrace, embrace your, children, your children's ability to be brilliant, to be articulate. You want your children to be intelligent. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you want your children to, mm -hmm. to break those curves, man. You know what I mean? Break the barriers and break the narratives and the stigmas of the things that we go through. Mm -hmm. And so now as I'm older, I'm not ashamed to show it. There were once upon a time, even with the hyphy movement, I dumbed down my music to be accepted. We started going dumb. We started doing the hyphy stuff. And it wasn't that I, I wasn't having fun. I was living it. Those were, you know, we were actually doing that, having fun. Good times. And we, we, were, we were having great times. But... I dumbed down a lot of my content because I knew that other people wouldn't understand it. But if you go back to that, if you go back to Son of a Pimp, it's two, three songs on there that may be considered hyphy. It was like Kicked Out the Club, Super Sick With It, and New Oakland. Yeah. Other than that, that album would be a reflective, conscious album. But that's just the records that people push. So if y'all get a chance to go listen to Son of a Pimp 1 and you be like, whoa, this record is like you know what I'm saying? It's a real, a conscious record. Yeah, it definitely is. It's I, a conscious record. I just promote that album for, for real. That came out, and I was, you know, during the time you had the yellow bus and the whole little movement that was going on, and those are the songs that got played the most because that was what was going on at the time. But if you were a connoisseur of Rapidor. if you were a connoisseur of, of real music and you dug into it, like you found that it was some knowledgeable things that. Like, well, I wasn't expecting this from you kind of situation. That's what I took from it when I was listening to it. Because when I was pushing it, I was like, okay. And I was like, listen, okay, those songs are like, but it's more to this album. And that's what kind of like piqued my interest in you as an artist. Right. Because I was like, nah, that, that just can't just be who he is. But uh, it was crazy. But when you talk about the kids embracing who they are, you, you make it almost like with your, your, your movement that you do, you give away backpacks. Was, was that in your way of saying like, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna help you get everything you need to where all you gotta do is just concentrate on your education? Because you do a lot of community things and how, you know, for years you've been doing the backpack thing now. Like, is it still, cause I know when I first saw you do it, every year that I see it since, it, it makes me, it gives me a sense of feeling good that you actually out here trying to help kids who, you know, mom and dads may not have the money to go out and get the new backpacks and all the, the, the stuff that they put on this long ass list now. Like, first of all, I remember when you went to school you, and you got your stuff. Now you got to buy stuff for the whole class and it be two, three pages worth of shit. You took that off of parents. So is that on your kind of situation? Is that you saying, Concentrate on school. Get your education. Don't let nobody disturb you from that shit. Or is it just for the simple fact? Or and it is is it for the simple fact that I know it's rough. I came through some shit and sometimes I didn't have what was needed. 
What was your your process on starting your whole backpack situation? I think it was solely based off that understanding how hard it is for children and parents these days mm -hmm. and those don't, in, in those times. Uh, this year approaching us, this will be the 20th year anniversary that we've been doing it. So for two decades. Applause, uh, bro. That's big. Every year, not missing a year, even during the pandemic. Uh, never taking any time off when it comes to the community uh, devotion. Being dedicated and devoted to the community of uh, economical empowerment, uh, financial literacy and teaching and, and building in and showing the importance of what it is to uh, the educational push that we're pushing. So providing those, not only the backpacks, but fully loaded backpacks, fully loaded backpacks with everything. And then we would even, over the years, we would even sneak in gift cards mm. uh, for college students to go get laptops and give out scholarships and things of that nature. This year we were able to give out over 200 scholarships worth $500 a piece uh, for the program that we launched. I launched a program called Oakland Reads this year. It's a literacy program to help children from one to seven learn reading. Uh, we understand through the statistics um, that if by the time you're in third grade, if you're not reading at a third grade or a higher level at, a, at that average level, you're uh, you're higher, you're 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 more prone to go down the other road to to you know a negative road. Crime will be in your future, man. Um, just based off the fact of your inability to read creates this other pathway for you. So we launched. The the reading program, Oakland Reads. Oakland Reads is uh, strictly for the kids to, to teach them development, learning, reading skills, and things of like that. So it's all it's all of that, man. It's all about saying, you know, um, I always say it's an African proverb out there that says the children that were embraced by the village will return and burn that village down. Um, I was embraced by my village, and so those that were embraced will return and build that village up. So this is all a part of the building of the village for me. And it's just it's not just the backpacks. It's more so about seeing these children where they are. You know, if many of us in influence or in position got a chance to realize, get off your high horse and begin meeting certain individuals where they are. Meet that kid where he is. He may not be a great student. He may not have great study habits. But... Find his brilliance and pour that, pour that into that. She may not be a, a, a mathematician, she may, but she may have great culinary skills. You know, let's let's pour that, let's pour into that. When we were young, my mother bought us Legos every Christmas. I never knew that she was pouring into the engineering side of things for me. I never looked at it like that. So when I gave my daughter Legos, she began to build stuff and I would be like, I would be marveled at what she was building because I never built anything with my Legos. But when I told her these are what they're for, and then when you see her getting older, now you see her in these science programs, these engineer programs, and now you're seeing in the infancy stages of helping her understand what Legos were for, she's ahead of the curve when it comes to her other classmates and people around her because she's had so much time building. So we have to curate and we have to pour into our children in that level to where we begin to teach our children what things are for, intentionally teaching them. You may be able to provide shoes, clothing, shelter, everything for your child, but you lack an emotional availability. You're providing everything that your child needs. You got food, they, you got meal, you have everything, but you're not emotionally available. Mm. You'll buy every present but you're never present. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, that's... You'll buy, you can buy every, every year I bought my daughter a bike for school, for, for Christmas. Every year. When she turned 10, she said, Dad, you know you bought me a bike every year for Christmas? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I always want you to have a bike. She said, you know something else? You never taught me how to ride a bike. How did that make you feel to hear that? It was, it was a rude awakening because here it is that when we come from the areas that we come from, we overcompensate for the things that we didn't have. And we think by overcompensating that we're a good parent. I'm buying my kid everything I never had. I'm doing everything for my child that I never had. But we're not teaching them everything that we never learned. We're not doing the other things that, that never happened to us because now we're overcompensating because we may be financially in position to do so. So it came down to here was the conundrum. 
Yes, I bought you presents. But I lacked in giving you my presents. Mm. That's, uh... <laughs> so my overcompensation of material things could never meet up to my lack of availability physically, spiritually, mentally. I weren't stimulating you in that regards. So children go to find stimulation from outside entities. Video games, streets, neighborhoods, gangs. These are all things that stimulate them emotionally and mentally that parents should be able to do. But since we're so focused on overcompensating for our lack of, we never notice that. And then we get mad at our children when we say, man, I gave that kid everything. Bought him every pair of Jordans. I bought him every bike. I can't, I spoiled that kid. Yeah, you spoiled him with earthly things and material things. But you were never there for them emotionally. I would tell my mom, I want to be an astronaut. When I get on, you better astronaut your ass in that room. <laughs> it started making you stop wanting to tell her what you wanted to be. So then you hid your dreams. Mm. And these are the things that we're dealing with. So now, with that, because you're saying, you know, your young queen was saying, Daddy, you bought me a bike every year. When you were heavy starting in your music, when you were actually really seeing real, I want to say, maybe compensation for, for, for your gift. To go back now and talk to Miss FAB of then, was there a time where you feel that maybe you weren't there a lot for her? Or, or was it a situation where you was trying to say, I got to work, I got to be able to get this, and I, I want to be able to do this, so I got to keep working. Because a lot of cats, you know, and I'm guilty of it too, where, you know, it's, you know, hustle every day until you die kind of situation. We want to stay up three, four days at a time, and it's always about the work and hustle. Were you already at a state of mind when you started making music that, yes, this is what I want to do, this is my job, but I still go home and I make sure that she feels my presence kind of situation? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, you know, we work. Unfortunately, we don't have the, uh, we don't have the luxury to take days off. No, because it's definitely hustle hard every day, rest when you die. Yes, it's, it's, for some, until you grow out of that survivor mode. You know, that's a survivor mode mentality. And many of us are in survivor mode. Some people are stuck in survivor mode. Uh, so, you know, you, you try to create balance. Okay. So it's always been a balance. You know, um, I think nowadays at, these, at this age that I'm at, um, I'd rather be more emotionally available to my daughter than anything. It's not even about the money and stuff or anything like that anymore. I mean, she's done. Here's a, a kid that has been around the world multiple times. She's been to five different continents. Um, and she's a great kid. Her mother's a great woman. Um, and I, I think the, the cohesiveness between her and I uh, helps for great parenting. Okay. Something that I recommend, whatever you do, you know, whether if it's your problem or her problem, learn to be the bigger person to have a greater understanding that whatever it is that you're going through with your counterpart, that you're doing it for the benefits of your children, not to raise your children in the same toxic environments that you came up in. Mm. You know, okay. do your best to do that. Do your best to remove that from your children. The toxicity is one of the reasons why our children go down the same roads that we went down. If you're a street nigga and your child becomes a street nigga because of choice, you failed. Like, just with, without choice. Like, if they just go become a street nigga and they wanted to do that, mm -hmm. that was just something they wanted to venture off. Right. But if you set up, set them in survivor mode, you fucked up as a parent. And people don't realize that. You put your child in the same survivor mode that you was in. You failed as a parent. But when you get to talking to people like that, people feel, you know, their insecurities clear. You know, Minister Farrakhan said it is okay to be ignorant to something. We are all ignorant to something. The problem is, is that most of us don't acknowledge that we're ignorant to it because ignorance has been looked at as a derogatory term. So if somebody tells you you're ignorant, instead of accepting that or pointing out what parts are, am I ignorant and interrogating that, you'll become defensive. And you'll be like, man, I ain't. And so you become defensive because your lack of knowledge creates frustration. And frustrations are the parents of violence. So you want to become violent because you're ignorant. Instead of learning what you're ignorant on and educating yourself to that, to remove ignorance, you want to be violent. 
And so we must be able to say ignorance is not a derogatory term. It is simply the lack of knowledge. Stupidity is a derogatory term because stupidity is actually knowing something and still acting out on it. So you learn to jump into these windows of these words and understand what it is. And so when we begin to learn the nomenclature of what certain words mean, we're able to identify it. In the Bible, God told Adam, learn to give names to things so you can identify them when you're around them. Be able to be observant and pick out certain shit in your life so you can see like, oh, okay, that's frustration, that's anger, that's depression. Oh, that's anxiety. Oh, that's separation, that's dehydration. We're able to give names to these things. You are the poster child of what real men should be. Not yet. I'm going to argue that point. <laughs> you can start, but not yet. I'll let you have that, but... Okay, we won't say, poster will say a flat. <laughs> we'll say the flat. Because you just sat here and you quoted Farrakhan. A couple seconds later, you quoted verses in the Bible. You talked about how you gave your, your, your baby girl Legos to enhance her thinking as far as engineering and, and, and architecture kind of situations. You, you, you've been in all the advanced classes that you've stepped out based on you didn't want to feel a certain way from your peers to now your baby girl is in these classes and you pushing her that way. Like, do you ever feel that sometimes in some rooms you can't be in because you go over go over their heads? Or, or, or do you feel like I'm, I'm going to take you up this hill with me because I want you to be in a position where you understand what I'm saying and, and I want you to be able to take this conversation away that we're having and put it someplace else later on. You can't always expect the fixed version of you and others. You can't expect the grown and mature version of you and others as well. So everybody won't be able to go. Um, as an, an orator and someone that is an educator, I've learned to meet people where they are, as I mentioned in the aforementioned. Uh, you learn to meet people where they are. If I'm in a strip club, I'm going to talk to them in a way that they understand the, the language of in the strip club. Mm -hmm. If I'm in a dice game, I'm not going to talk the same way that I talk on the tables in Vegas. So your environment affects yeah, your environment. Who, who, who fab is at the time? No, your environment is the language that you use. Language is everything. In every life, there's a language. Okay. Every level of life, there's a language. Okay. Shout out my cousin Bruce Banner just came in this thing, man. Be what up, baby lady. Um, yeah. um, everything in life is a language. And in the different levels of life, there are different languages. And something represents the same thing. Well, we have, we're in the hood, oh, that's a whip. That's a foreign. It's old school. The congruent version of that. That's a car. Right. But in our areas that we're in, we learn the language that it's identified or referenced to. What's the difference between... We learn our environment. We learn our environment. So, and you learn to adjust. Right. Some people's greatest adjustments that they're great adjusters. Right. So you're able to fit in and be a chameleon in any form. I'm comfortable in the strip club as I am in the Senate. I think the way I was raised up, my father was military. Right. So we were all around the world and I, 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 I think that benefited me because it, it took me out of my little bitty town in Thomasville, Georgia, and it gave me a broader view of what the world really was. Oh, definitely. Like I didn't, I didn't see different ethnic people in my town. Right. But when I got, started moving, I started being able to say, now that I saw everybody, right. I started being able to adapt. If I'm in this classroom and they're like this, I can I can be in here too. You learn different. I can languages. go to the hood. I can go to the state capitol and talk. Which I've gone to the state capitol and have dinner and I've held conversations. Like I really adapt to my environment. Why are people so scared to change their environment? Have you ever been around somebody that has never been outside of their environment? Yeah. Imagine how scary it would be going somewhere else and having to develop and adjust. I've never been there. How am I supposed to act if I go, if I've never been there? I've never been privy to any of the knowledge. I don't know the language there. I'm scared. 
That's as if asking someone from another country to be dropped off in this Go to a different base. Like, what, uh, how, get, how am I supposed it. to adjust? I you know, and, and, and in life, we have to learn to recognize things because things fall under our nose. Like, if I was to ask you, what's the difference between... Uh, if I say, scientifically, a male and a female, is that the same as a... Man and a woman? I would have to say no. Why? Because male and female is just a title of what you are anatomy wise. To be a man and a woman, you have to take on certain positions and certain roles to be that name, I guess you can say. So, like, as a man, you, you be, take care of your family. Work hard. A oh, woman can't take care of the family? No, she can. But, you know, as children being raised, you know, if you were lucky to have both your parents, I was. I wasn't. You know, my father told me some certain things. You, you don't do this. If you a man doesn't cry. Right? My, dad, my dad was that southern military dude, like men don't cry. Men work hard and do all the things. But at the same time, my mother, very intelligent woman, strong as, can, as anybody on this planet, taught me to be smart, to be a gentleman, to, to know that there's nothing that I can't achieve if I, if I put my mind to a kind of situation. And then I'll give you this through a different lens, because that is, you know, those are, those are great fruits of baskets of life. But here's the answer. Mm -hmm. A male and a female can be a male frog, a female frog. A man and a woman is a human characteristic. So, so scientifically, that, that's the difference. A male and a female can be anything. We can talk about any species. Right. But pertaining to a man and a woman. So a human. That's a human. That's a, you know, a, a, a homo sapien species. Because those are the only things that are identified as a male or a woman. Other than that, it's male or female. Okay. So you know what I'm saying? It, it has nothing to do with binary connections or anything of that nature. I said that to say... We must always analyze things from a different lens of life because in language, one small word can change the whole complexity of a situation. So it's key and it's pivotal that we begin to learn how to analyze things from different lenses. I was raised with a father who had no problem crying. That gave me a chance to be emotionally available to my children because I have to be in touch. I had a friend who was raised by a father who was in the military and he never cried once. Mm -hmm. But his father also never told him that he loved him. And his father also never told, never came to his basketball games. His father also never met him emotionally in places where he was feeling weak. So he hid away from his father. He hid away from his father so much that he curved into the person that his father never wanted him to be. Mm. Okay. So when we talk about some people don't believe in this, over masculinity the tough love isn't enough love it's some of us that have been raised on tough love and that shit turned us into killers some of my friends have become killers gangsters ran to the streets because they was raised on tough love nigga you better not cry you better not woo woo and then we, we marginalize the rationality of what we've become We'll be next to a nigga, we'll sit up and watch Jeffrey Dahmer and everybody like, man, that nigga was sick, man, that nigga was crazy. Woo, 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 woo. And I'm not talking about his perversions. I'm not talking about whatever his sexual choice was or anything. I'm just talking about the fact of how many people he killed and what he was in dope. But you'll sit up with a nigga who got six, seven bodies and smoke weed with him every day. You know a serial killer. All of us right now in our community, we know a nigga that's a serial killer. But we don't look at it like that. you are like, oh, that's just my nigga. No, your nigga's a serial killer. And he may not be out here raping men and doing shit like that, but nigga, that nigga's sick too. He's a serial killer. You know, he, and you'll brag about it. You'll brag about, my nigga got bodies, nigga. Oh, woo, woo, nigga got five tattoos, nigga. Oh, that nigga smack, woo, woo, nigga, that nigga's a serial killer. Yeah. And that's a sickness. Yeah. But until we're able to look at things through these lenses, we'll continue to repeat the same mistakes that have led us down the path of plagues. Now, with that being said, how 
it's things are looked at and how you analyze and look through these lenses. You recently had, I forget the name, forget the therapy. The thug therapy. With you being able to sit up and say the things you just did with the Dahmer and the homies and you know, was that your, your was that your thought process when you came up with your thug therapy? Because what you just said now is probably the reason why you created that. I created the therapy for one, acknowledging that it was some things that I was going through. Okay. Dealing with the depression, dealing with anxiety, um, dealing with uh, other things that I was dealing with, not real, not realizing that it was what it was. You know, um, sometimes we have been uh, over sexualized. We have we have been exposed to things in our communities. You know, there are men. You know, the phobias of being alone. Uh, failure, abandoned phobia, being let down, being left alone, being lied to, different trust issues. And these are all things that create layers. And many of us are layered. We're layered to the level of we don't get a chance to get in touch with who we actually are. So we'll go through our whole life not actually ever meeting ourselves. We'll meet millions of people. We'll meet thousands of people. But we'll never, ever meet ourselves. Some of us have never met us. And that may sound crazy. But we've layered ourselves so much. We layered ourselves to the streets. We became the name they called us in the streets. Mm -hmm. We layered ourselves to what women knew of us. We labeled ourselves to our reputation. All of these things that fall under stigmas or fall up under subsidiaries of who we actually are. We became that. We became the rap name. We became the athlete. We became the, 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 the moniker. We became all of these things, but we have never met ourselves. Reason being is because we hated ourselves or we, we, we didn't feel confident in ourselves. Okay. We created these we created these egos and we created these things to you know to represent us instead of us going to go represent. I've been around people uh too short, I call too short my rap dad. I've been around short uh when the camera's on, I've been around when the camera's off. Too short is a purse is a character. Okay. He's a character that he created because in actuality, he was really shy. Like, if you get a chance to meet Todd, he's really shy. I met him and I can definitely see that. He's shy, he's laid back, he's like, he's very shy. He's definitely laid back. I would say, because I don't know him as well as what? you, I would say he was more laid back, didn't want to be involved with the kind of situation. Because he's shy. Okay. Like, you know what I'm saying? You meet 40. If you don't, if you catch forty outside of E forty, Earl, he is the most laid back. He's shy. Uncle, uncle is definitely, definitely that person. They're shy, like, and, and I'm not, and I'm not saying shy in the traditional shy way that right. some people may associate with. You know what I'm saying? Unmanly, nah, right. not, not nothing, nothing like that. They're just some. You know, public speaking is the number one fear in the world. That's the number one fear. That's the biggest fear ever. This is the true fact. Public pu public speaking. That's true. So these they're actually shy. So they have to do things to get into that character. Some of us, it just comes to us naturally. You know what I mean? Those, that's just who we are. Mm. So to bring the circle, bring bring it full around, full circle. I created the therapy for one. I knew what I needed, and I knew that here it is. If this guy who people like to call the poster boy for this and for that. If I was hiding who I was from me, how many other men was hiding and what they were running from? And so the stands for teaching, healing, uniting, and guiding. I felt that we should create a workshop that strictly focuses on revealing to heal, being able to come out and say, this is what has been troubling me. These are the layers that I've dealt with. How can I continue to grow? And as we grow, we grow towards economical development. We grow to financial empowerment. We grow through community um, community building. And the ultimate goal is to heal from some of the things that have haunted us. There are childhood traumas that follow us into adulthood. Yeah. You know, there's a somewhere right now, there's a 40-year-old man blaming his mother for not going to the NFL. And he'll say... She never came to my games and she never supported me. And in his mind, he leaves the fact that maybe you just weren't good enough. Right. Maybe you weren't whatever it was. But 
you blame your mom. So that's your crutch. That means that's a layer that you're not healing from because you associate your mom not supporting you at your games as the reason for you not to play the best version of yourself and make that, you know. Those are things that build, you know, so mm -hmm. your, your resentment. And, and it goes like this. Unaddressed emotion turns into resentment. Resentment turns into anger. Anger turns into frustration. Frustration are the parents of violence. And that's what we watch displayed in our communities. Because there are two emotions that men are able to show. That's anger and frustration. We're given that. Oh, you can show you mad, you can show you frustrated. If you're mad, get off where you're mad at. So now we can show mad and frustration. 83% of murders are committed by men. The emotions that we aren't able to show, vulnerability, depression, anxiety, all these other things that are self-inflicted, that we have to process and internalize. Mm -hmm. That leads to 87% of suicides being committed by men. So when they ask who's the more emotional being, it's men. Because we can't identify with our true emotions. We don't authentically embrace them. We hide them. Whereas a woman can be as erratic and emotional as she is because that's the nature of what she should be. She can be that. She's a woman. She can be emotional. She can be erratic. She can be... At least she understands what it is. Mm. Men don't understand our emotions, so either we hide them and kill ourselves, or we show them and kill each other. So thug therapy was a necessary workshop for us in the discovery of what is bothering us, what is triggering us, who did it to us, how can we help it, and how can we get over it? How can we address that childhood trauma and not let it spawn into our adulthood, which plagues us from being the best versions of ourselves. Bro, you, you you overflowing with some would call it game, but you got knowledge pouring out your ears. If ever your music become something that you don't want to pursue anymore. Are you looking to get into like counseling, uh, your degrees in, in, in this therapy thing? Like you increase the intelligence. You you bring the IQ value up in every room you walk into. And the things that we talked about was the kids, how they were raised for the school, now you you touching on grown men, making sure that you know they identify with themselves to where they're not feeling weak, but they can understand this is in you too. You do the backpacks, you do the, the thug therapy situation. Like if music ever ends for you, because I, I personally, I personally think you're gonna be the mayor, but that's just me. <laughs> but. You, you talked about earlier about being able to view through lenses your community. You came up with a dope pair store. You could have put that anywhere. And I remember when you first opened, you said, this is where we are. You know, we're not in the best area, but we're here for the people. With you being able to put it anywhere, do you use your dope pair store kind of like a, a station to where you identify certain things in the community that needs to be helped? Because... For somebody to come up with the thug therapy situation, that take a lot. Like that's not something that would just occur in a a Dr. Phil or even an Oprah show. Like that was something that was the process to think of. How long did it take you to come up with that? I think it's been growing. It's been growing. For now is that because of what you've been through, or what you've seen, or what you think you can fix? I don't think I can fix anything. I just think that I can fill voids. For one to feel that he can fix the world's problems, you'll have a bigger problem. I can't be responsible for how you think. You know what I mean? I can't make it a conscious effort on what you think. Now with that, do you take that same thought process into your music now? Yeah, I've always had. I, I've always had. I've always been able to utilize. You know, music is everything. Music is a marketing tool. Music is 
propaganda. You know, the minister says that one rap song is just as equivalent to 10,000 of his lectures. You know, um, and we must understand that with music, we have an ability to reach the masses far faster than anyone has ever been able to do. And the greater your influence, the more people you're able to reach. Now, with you being a successful artist and being able to reach people and have people understand certain things that if somebody was speaking it to them, they probably wouldn't get it. But to hear it in one of your songs, we get it right away. Mm -hmm. Do you see, obviously you see the advantage of it, but do you feel that, like the minister has said, you know, one song to 10,000 of his speeches, do you feel that one day your music will touch areas and markets and people that you never thought would be able to understand certain things like you expressing your music? It already has. My music has already touched different people. I've been around the world and been recognized. I've, I've had music stream all around the world and it already has. Uh, and it just also, it, it depends on, you know, as we analyze the dichotomy of it and figure out which trajectory of what approach we're willing to go. What is it that we want to talk about and address it? We must understand that the masses' attentions is only so much, and they're only going to focus on so many things. As we talked about, it just takes one word to change a whole contract. You know, and it just takes one song for someone to feel that they should pigeonhole you and to be this way. I began began to be the poster boy for hyphy music off two songs. Facts. And all of the things else that I was doing was ignored. Everything that I'm, the conscious records, the if it was a fifth, if you could call heaven to different other records that I had at that time was totally ignored. They they had they, they didn't even care about it at that point because I had been coined to be this way. Now it's crazy you say that. Your last album, I can't quite remember the name, but it was a smash hit to me. But a lot of my peers when they were listening to me, they like, oh, Fab ain't Fab no more. Right. And I was like, how do you figure Fab's not Fab anymore? Yeah, they want you to be they want you to be the lower vibrating frequency version of yourself. You know, people want you, they never want you to grow. They never want you to go and, and, and to expanding or say, oh man, Michael Jordan ain't Michael Jordan no more. He ain't dunking from the free throw. I think he's shooting 15 footers now. Oh man, LeBron James ain't LeBron James no more. He ain't playing 50 minutes a game. Right. And that's how people are. Does that um, frustrate you though? Not at all. Because as I said, I can't tell a person how to think. I'm not responsible for that. I can't be held accountable or responsible for what it is that you think. You will have your own thoughts and you'll do whatever you want to do. You'll be judged. You'll Because I also understand that what you're dealing with internally is something that I may never know, especially if you never express it. There's somebody right now walking around with 20 layers of themselves. And they're looking for anybody to be a punching bag. They're looking to criticize anyone. They're looking to victimize anyone, to pulverize, to brutalize. They're willing to do anything to someone else to get the attention off the help that they need to do themselves. Mm, okay. You know what I'm saying? Some person that right now, you know, you be telling the person somebody wants to fight you or somebody wants to do something to you or cause harm to you. Um, Brother Light, my grandmother always told me that you have to be mindful that when you become a light, there will be moths around. You don't cut your life off because you're afraid of moths or because you don't, you're tired of the moths. You understand that with light comes the moths. So you have to be able to be the light in the midst of all the moths and not let the moths affect how bright your light shines. I've never heard of that. <laughs> I've never even thought of it that way. But to hear it and think about it now, that makes so much sense. For sure. Many of us are lights. There are lights in this life. And in this life, there are certain individuals that are, there are lights. And in those lights, there are moths around. There are some moths that come around because they like the light. There are other moths that come around because they're tired of being in the darkness. And you have to be able to have the discernment and to be able to decipher what moths are around you for what. And you be careful around that. Never to allow those moths to damper your light or hinder you from being able to be the light. So be careful with the situations that you put yourself in by being vulnerable to poisonous moths. There are moth men that come to cause you harm and they'll be in the form of just a regular moth. And if you don't have the ability to decipher what their intentions are, 
you can be harmed. There are many leaders that have fell victim to moths. Some sides in some areas where we're from, people from their own side kill them. Because those are the only people that are able to break the barriers and break the chains to get close to them. And they hid in the midst of moth clothing. But they were poisonous wasps. So you have to be mindful of that. To always be observant and never become naive to thinking that because you who you are, that someone won't endanger you. I think many of the people have, several kings have lost their kingdom and jeopardized the safety of their kingdom because of lack of security. And lack of security is observation skills. And they became vulnerable to the moths that was around them. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and say on the music situation because then if that's the case, you as the artist, well-known artist, can be considered a light. Your fans, the industry, and competing artists can all be considered to be moths. In any part of the game, maybe not for you right now, but a lot of young artists, they're always told, make sure your circle is small. Make sure you keep it tight and trust that person. I don't, the way that you, you move, we don't really see your circle. One, does Fab have a circle like that? And two, how are you making sure that you're secure within your circle? Do you base it off of their knowledge of what they can do for you or what they've done for you? Or you base it off of you got to go through these steps for me to get to a point where I can actually trust you to handle some things? Um, DMX said something that was very informative to this me. This man is called Farrakhan. The Bible. <laughs> now we're going straight to DMX. My ex said some X X was a X was a lot. Yes. You know, X said something that was very uh, it was informative. He said, you know, I I can't trust people. I trust people for what they are. I trust things for what they are. If you're a dog, I trust you to bark. If you're a snake, I trust you to hiss and to bite. If you're a fish, I trust you to swim. And your keen observation skills have to come from being able to identify with people with what they identify as. And you trust them to be that. But we're human. And so you, you fall victim to trusting the wrong individuals by trusting them too much. I trust you to be as you are. And therefore, you can't get hurt by that situation. I am a man of strong faith and belief, and I believe that if there is anything that is meant for me, it won't miss me. And what is not meant for me won't hit me. So in the midst of all of the things that this world brings, as long as I'm on the path of my purpose, I feel protected. So you have a sense of fearlessness. Almost. Uh, not so much. I have a sense of purpose. Okay. And there are things that I uh, fear. And any man that says that they don't fear anything is a lie. Right. I fear my daughter going to school and there's a bomb at her school. I fear uh, those that I love being endangered. People lie and be like, oh, I don't fear nothing. That's a lie. That's your bravado talking. Mm-hmm. You know, so for a man to openly admit the things that he feared lets him know that there is purpose of life. If you have nothing to lose and all to gain, that's a dangerous man. I have a lot to lose. So there are things that one should fear and be mindful of. But as you walk on your purpose, I'm a sole believer in knowing that as long as I'm within my angel's jurisdiction, then, then there should be nothing that harm me. And if it was meant for me, it was meant as a lesson. And if that is the demise of me, then I won't be here to feel it anyway, so... Okay. May the remnants of my legacy be remembered. Wow. Okay. Wow. Boy, you gotta be on your toes when you sit around and talk about Fab. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, well, we catching you today in the studio. Yeah. So that means you back to work. For sure. I, I never stop working. I'm in the studio every day. Yeah, I know, but you know, I got to do it for the interview. Hell yeah, yeah, no, nah, I'm in the lab yeah. every day, man. But, uh, so, so, with with you being in the lab every day doing as great as Fab does, you know, we looking at a project here pretty soon? I just drop, tactics? I drop records all the time, man. Like, p to the people that, the core base that rock with me, if they rock with me, they know I'm always dropping an album. I'm just, you, I might drop something tomorrow. <laughs> like, nah, no plan. Like, this this week, alone, I think we did like 80 songs this week. Let me see. Yeah, Rick. Rick, how many songs we did this in the past week? In the, just like in the past week, in the past like two or three. Past week. Um, what about two weeks? The past two weeks, at, at, at least 50. Probably 60. Well, like 60 songs. That's just at this studio. Something like that. Like, so I probably got about 100 songs in the past two weeks. But I've been, cause I, I jump studio like, like here, and then I go to like my home studio. So I got like a hundred, so I'm just working, you know. This is my vehicle of expression. As you can see, I got a lot to talk about. Uh, I'm long-winded. Is this your therapy doing yeah, yeah. music? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I don't do music to say, oh man, I'm trying to go make a number one hit, man. I'm trying to go be, yeah, I'm not, I make music just because this is my therapy. Yeah, but you've had number one hits. Not number one, you know, I've had regional records. That was uh, local success, you know. It's It's been enough. Uh, let me be not unappreciative or sound as if I am marginalizing uh, what I've done and what I've accomplished. I'm very, very much so proud of everything that I've done. Uh, but I've had enough to create a career where I've never had to go to jail. I've never had to, you know, scam or steal to be in, in position. I've, you know, I've been able, I've never had a job in my life. I've been able to solely live off my pen and my pad, and that's a blessing. That's the greatest feeling that a man can accomplish to live off the fruits of something that he has inherited from a higher source. Uh, cultivated, of course, by hard work and dedication. But um, I'm cool, man. I, you know, I have a fan base that, that rock with me and to the core fan base that have uh, kept, me go kept, kept me going and kept me alive all of these years, even those that have turned coat, uh, the Fairweather fans that say so. But to those that have been uh, unwaveringly supportive of what the things that I've done, you are appreciated. And those are the people that I make music for. You know, I make music for and I drop it and I, and I rock it. And uh, I'm just thankful to still be in a position to be doing what I love to do. There are many people that have lost their passions. And uh, they have, to, have found alternatives. And it's not so passionate about it, it becomes a job. I don't look at this as a job. I, I wake up every day, man, and, and just be blessed that I'm still here, man. I'm able to still be embraced in my city. Even Jesus was in love in Nazareth initially. So for me to be able to walk in my city and to be embraced and to get peace signs and haze and highs and hey man, I'm, I'm just a kid living in this dream still. Now with your music, because you can't just say one kind of person likes your music because you got stuff for the party people, you got something for the street people, you got something for, the, you need to really sit down and think about this people. Like, has anybody ever said to you like, you're you're strictly in this lane and only this lane. No, they've said I like you in this lane and only this lane. Who is who? Who sees you? I mean, you've been around the world and I, yeah, yeah. So when you're out and about, do you find it that the urban crowd really acknowledges you and recognizes you and really comes to talk to you or? The other side of the tracks crowd. And I say that to like this. Too short. Who you have put on a whole different pedestal than what people have already should have already had in mind by talking about how he put on for the city. And sure. He's done these things and you did the same thing with Hammer. But I've been to Too Short's concerts. Some in the hood where, you know, all the brothers and sisters and, you know, the niggas and, and everybody. All the niggas. They, they know him word for word. Mexicans and ones. But I've seen Short in a concert where it was full of Barbie dolls. For sure. And they knew even where he was inhaling before his verse came out. Man, yeah, man, you know, that's, that's music though, man. You know, um, unfortunately, uh, our people aren't in a position financially to go out and support everything that we do. They'll take what they like. Outside of the music that we make, there are the larger consumers of individuals or those that are financially in position to do so. 
Have a lot because of black people. No, definitely not. Being supporters. Hip hop is gradually kept alive and kept afloat because uh, those other crowds have been very supportive Becky and we're Barbie, very appreciative of it. Becky, Barbie, Dave, so, and Biff. So we're definitely thankful of those individuals and we continue to keep making music. Uh, to me, to answer your question, I am embraced uh, by many different walks of life. You know, there are politicians that love what I do. There are street politicians, there's gang bangers, there's young homies, there's big OGs, there's, you know. Um, I've had a multitude of hats in my hat collection and um, I wear them accordingly and uh, some people love me for it and some people don't like me for it. Some, you know, in the streets they say, oh man, you, you trying to do this, you trying to do that, it is what it is. I'm not here to please any of those practitioners that are pushing a philosophy of uh, propaganda. I am here. Has there ever been somebody, not to cut you off, I'm sorry, but has there been anybody who has come up to you and acknowledged that they love your music that you were kind of surprised that they yeah, a lot of different people. People where you like, damn, you know me? That was dope. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, seeing people, still shocked at uh, certain individuals, certain folks who you even just like, damn, you know who I am, you know? I'm, I'm still a humble fan of this shit, man. I still, you know, I love it, bro. I love music. I go up to people. I met Mike Mosley the other day for the first time, and I just, I fanned out. <laughs> yeah. I was like, bro. I was shocked you just met him now for the first time. I met him just the other day at the E-40 unveiling of his street. I met him, I was I was fan. I was like, bro, Mike Mosley. He was, and he was so shocked that I was, you know, treating him the way that he was. And it was genuine. I met Mike Mosley back in the day when Bo was running around with yeah, AWOL. Yeah. But I wasn't, you know, I wasn't I wasn't privy to that. You know what I'm saying? I came at a generation like right after that. He had began, you know, I I, I came from the, wow. a different generation. So I was super juiced to meet him. I'm Tom Capone and all of those producers, mm-hmm. you know, and, and certain other I was Juice to meet these dudes, like, dude, like, y'all part of my childhood legacy. Um, so, hell yeah, man, it'd be, it be stuff like that, man. But it'd be love, though, man, you know? At the end of the day, man, it's just... I mean, that's what it brings down to. That's, that's real love to be juice to meet Mike Mosley because that was the era before yeah, you came yeah. I remember I was juice to meet... I met Mace, right? I met Mace at South by Southwest, and he fronted on me, right? He shitted on me. <laughs> And, but it was still cool because it couldn't take away from my childhood memories and it didn't make me stay in my childhood memories. Right. You know? I'm not that kind of person, man. I'm like, hey, man, shit, you just, you know? Nori said one time, he said, man, don't meet your childhood heroes. He said, because they'll let you down mm-hmm. and they'll make you question your childhood. You know what I'm saying? And to me, it'd just be like, hey, shit, hey, man, probably was having a bad day, man, you know? I'll give a person the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he was having a bad day. Maybe, maybe he's an asshole. Maybe, you know, whatever it is. Don't take away from the days, nigga, that I grew up off Harlem World, and that shit is still right. one of the dopest albums to this still. day. Uh, would I go out and see if I saw him again? Would I be? I'd be like, nah. I remember you shit it on me, my nigga. It's all good though. Maybe you know. That's how I am. I don't. I don't take things personal. Okay. You know, it's eight billion people in this world. Who am I to take something personal? You know, I just be like, hey, man, it is what it is. You just know how to move accordingly. You don't take things personal, but how do you take it? Like when E Forty calls you to tell you to speak. Because the city of Vallejo was giving him a street. That was an honor. It's definitely an honor. Um, to be uh, asked to accompany a man on a lifetime accomplishment goes to show you how much he thinks of me, uh, which is very equivalent of what I think of him. Um, Too Short did the same mm-hmm. with his street. He was like, yo, come up and speak. And I'm honored to be able to uh, share space with people who I grew up idolizing. But to be idolized by, to idolize these people that you grew up coming up and loving their music and how they were moving, like, they're telling you. Can I get some pictures, Stanley and Kirby? I'm doing an interview right now. Yes, ma'am, what you need? Hold on, give me one second. <laughs> we, we have a little time. We have, we're doing an interview. <laughs> What's going on? You going to go speak? Huh? You going to speak? Right there? Well, you you have the matador so, on you, so the attention will always be really there. You know, understand red, when the man invites you to his studio attention. session, you really on his time. So, so now so as you we, have we, we here on West Coast Wednesdays on HypeRadio.com. Slow, but we definitely on uh, to the point. Mr. Fabs, don't don't talk circles. Uh, allow us you know to be I mean? a studio person. Don't talk circles. But. Be intentional. At the same time, we sit here, you never know Almost who's going like to slide in on the, on the interview. Asshole. Because, you know, we got, 
Mr. Man in, in the studio tonight. Man. You know, Straight to the point. He, he decided to bless us circle. with his little presence over mm -hmm. here. We ain't talking about seeing my dogs. This is what I'm doing. Woo! Since and he uh, first came home, first came home, he threw on a polo suit. So we're going to be later on, we're going to talk about the professional that can't be told again. But we're going to wait for Mr. Fast to get on the phone here. I'm still healing. I'm still growing. I'm still learning. He's doing his thing. But, uh, Cause, you know what I'm saying? You know, there ain't nothing you greater put, than you put a cap on yourself. And this man, now it's like you can't be corrected, is, you can't be directed. Uh, 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 a running river, of or you can't be directed, you can't be corrected. One of community. them, you know what I'm saying? So he still you have to be able to say he's respected I'm, by his peers. I'm not healed. I'm healing, and and, and he really has a, a knowledge of who he. This really is my knowledge. Is. I'm here to share what so I've learned. Like, you know, it sounds like that's what he's doing on the phone right now. We're giving more teaching, yeah. but. Uh, yeah, but, but intentional in, with this man, so in your healing process, we, I'm, we, this is we, what I've done. We, we this is what I'm doing. This is what's working for me. You know, make sure that you follow you know, us on the gram. So, you know, still free. showing vulnerability, make but sure still showing the security. www.hype-radio.com. Yeah, let me know. Take some pictures make and sure let me know. Get us on tune in. Take us everywhere you go. We here for you. We are here to help. I like it. Artists be artists and help put a word like for the community. So, you look beautiful. You know, this is what it is. Gentlemen, make sure you pay attention when you get off the phone with your woman. This is how you do it. So if y'all didn't catch that, just make sure you acknowledge that shit. But nigga, I got to get back to this work, man. Hey, I love you, man. Hype radio. Listen, if y'all took anything from this interview, because it might have to get broke up in parts. Yeah, um, many parts. I just want y'all to know, man. Hey, be authentic in whatever it is that you do. You know what I'm saying? I I, I tell people I don't know it all. I'm learning. I've lost, I lose, I will lose in the future. There are certain situations that I may, I, but I'm going to go out and I'm going to give a valiant effort every time. I'm going to be who I am unadulteratedly. I'm going to continue to grow. I'm going to be able to walk in certain rooms, be comfortable in certain rooms. Even when I'm uncomfortable, learn how to be comfortable in those rooms. I want to learn as much as I can possibly learn. I want to teach. Uh, and I still want to be able to be human. Sometimes we superhero ourselves so much we lose touch of who we are. Like I say, some people have lived their whole life and have yet to meet themselves. So get in touch with meeting who you are, man. So, you know, never forget who you wanted to be. To me, that's a key saying and, and the sentiments that represent what I live in life. Never forget who you wanted to be before the world stripped your innocence. Before the hood turns you into this gangster or this mob nigga or this scammer or this pimp or this. Never forget that boy who was like, man, I want to be an astronaut. Man, I want to be track and field. Man, I want to be a chef. Man, I want to be a police officer. Man, I want to be a firefighter. Man, I want to be an EMT. Remember when we was kids and we had those, what we wanted to be? I wanted to be a cowboy. I want whatever it is. That's when our imagination was working at the greatest level that it is. And imagination is the only way to make you see outside of your situation. Those are my words. I appreciate y'all so much. Big bruh. You already know. I radio. We in the feeling. And uh, let's keep growing and keep building. The airway. Make sure y'all follow me. <laughs> Make sure you follow the music and get on these videos. Uh, I'm your man Shadow. This has been West Coast Wednesday. It's hype ready, baby. But show. Hype is real. Appreciate you. How you got it? What you doing, man? Oh, shit.